Oi oi, it's your boy, Saucy Jack. It's the Jack Slack podcast. It's coming at you on Monday, the 24th of May, and we're entering the off-season, or we're already in the off-season. Um, yes, I was looking at the next UFC card. Uh, it is a war crime. <laughs> it has what should be illegal, three back-to-back heavyweight fights as the main, co-main, and then co-co-main? What, what was the next thing down? Um, yeah. And then I realised it's two weeks before that even. So, uh, yes, we're we're entering the dregs of the content mines. But I am the hardest content miner, and I will work hard to get an episode out of, today, out of um, last weekend's fights today. But we're going to jump straight in with the main event of the UFC card, obviously. Not, not the main event of the Bellator card. The main event of the UFC card was Rob Font versus Cody Garbrandt. This is the one we basically focused on last week in the preview, or... Yeah, last week in the preview. Um, and yes, a lot of the stuff we talked about came up and a lot of the questions that we asked were answered and they were answered in the affirmative by Rob Font. Um, pretty much a shutout. One judge managed to give Cody Garbrandt two rounds, but as I was watching it, I thought Font was in control basically all of the time except when he was taken down. And when he was taken down, um, you know, he wasn't really getting hurt or anything. So in that regard, he was sort of in control there too. But um, yes, I mean, this this fight was a, a love letter to the jab. And the question we asked coming in was, can Font continue to close the distance to where he feels comfortable jabbing without having to worry about the Cody Garbrandt power coming back? And the answer was yes. He closed him down. He backed him up the entire time. Because the whole, I mean, if you watch it from the get-go, Cody Garbrandt's answer to being jabbed up is to try and re-establish a range that's greater than like a traditional boxing distance because if he's on the end of you know on um on the end of uh, Rob Font's jabbing range the jab is always an option and it's very very hard to react in time if a guy's got a really good convincing jab and convincing feints and that's what you saw in this one like a lot of the time uh Garbrandt was trying to chuck back a big right hand over the top and most of the times when he threw it Rob Font wasn't actually jabbing, you know, because he, he was shoulder fainting so often. He was uh, drop stepping slightly with his lead foot, um, like crouching in and, and acting as if he was jabbing. And uh, Garbrandt would react to that instead. But Rob Font's jab, lovely, as always. Um, if you if you watch it, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of different sorts of jabs that work really well. There are guys who flick it. There are guys who step in behind it. I think most MMA fighters, um, certainly back in the day, but even now as guys are getting better at applying the jab most of them learn to step with the jab and really put some thud on it and believe me that has a place i'm not saying it doesn't but there's also that jab that rob font especially shows which is where you throw your jab out in front of you uh, like it's detached from your stance almost and um you know you can watch this cody garment fight and it looks like he's just flinging it away from himself uh and it's, yeah, if you're really good at that and you've got a bit of a reach too, which is something else that Font uh, benefited from in this fight, if you're very good at that, it makes it very hard for the opponent to bite onto something. If you lunge in with a big stepping jab, like to put your fist through their face up to the, you know, up to the elbow, um, they slip, you wade into whatever they're coming back with. If you're just fl- uh, throwing it out on the front of your stance, like like it's separate to you, uh, it's very difficult for the other guy to come back and find you. Which is what you saw a lot of in this fight. Cody Garbrandt really struggling to um, get get going on the return, even when he was able to slip the jabs. And basically, the, the, the fight was a cycle through uh, several different reactions from Cody Garbrandt, uh, you know, how to deal with this jab. Because he couldn't get past step one of the fight because he couldn't deal with the jab. So sometimes he was trying to slip it, sometimes he was trying to um, parry it, sometimes he was trying to ignore it. And then, you know, ignoring the jab is guys get into the sort of like the last um, resort because as, as soon as you start ignoring it, the, yeah, yes, the other guy's not been throwing it with any power on it, but it doesn't take much for him to change it and start throwing it with power or to start sneaking through the right hand behind it. Uh, the double jab to right straight was money in this fight. And, uh, you know, if you ignore the first two blows because they're not, 
hurting you they're just bruising you you know hurt is a relative term because like chael sonnen said about fighting michael bisping that everything he flew through hurt like being slapped in the face you know but then there are guys who hit you and like you know your legs go wobbly every time they touch you and certainly that's not the case with rob font's jab it's probably going to ignore you but you could ignore it if you wanted to but if you do the right hand's going to sneak through like lightning behind it and that's what uh, Garbrandt was getting caught by. Those were the ones that really hurt him. But Garbrandt's reaction to the, the... We talked about, like, the calf kick and how that can be used to deal with good jabbers. And that's why the calf kick's doing so well in MMA at the moment. Don't um, get too caught up in, like, the calf kick being unbeatable because guys can just kick each other from kicking range. Um, the way that the calf kick has really been hurting in big fights is that it takes away the jab. It's some of the really good boxers out there you know, MMA boxers who were getting done in by it. Um, Max Holloway, Calvin Cater, Conor McGregor, you know, it, it fucks your day up because if you want to step in and blade your stance, you're just there for the calf kick as a counter. Uh, and Cody really wasn't very able to do that, to uh, to use the calf kick as a counter when Font was stepping in. And part of that is also Font wasn't like lunging in with his jab. He was flicking it out in front of him, occasionally stepping in, sometimes not stepping in, sometimes flicking the jab and then stepping in. And Cody's answer to that in the early going was to try and back up and then get to the fence. And you saw it against um, a Sun Sao. He's done it a couple of times, but especially against a Sun Sao. When he hits the fence, he does that move his head side to side stuff, levels his stance out. And then, um, you know, he either goes out the side door or the opponent lunges in like uh, a Sun Sao did and he sparks him. Unfortunately, Font was just there, like showing him the jab, showing him the feints, making him move his head and um, spend up his ideas before actually having to do anything. So you saw Font catch him there a couple of times with like a, a fake jab and then a real jab and then a body shot. Um, but uh, Cody was doing well in the early going, level changing under the jab and, and taking Font down. I uh, did that in the first couple of rounds. Font on the ground was fine, I thought. Well, fine is probably a bit harsh, actually, but uh, I thought he did a good job. He did, I mean, he didn't get hit at all. Uh, he attacked Kimura for a while. Oh, he, did, he actually freed it and got it behind Cody's back and turned him over, which was pretty cool. Um, but generally, he just didn't look too concerned with being on the bottom. And um, I think probably this being a five-round fight really helped him in that regard because he wasn't really able to stop Cody from taking him down in the first two rounds. But as the, the rounds progressed, Cody was less keen to shoot and being forced to stay on the feet more. And obviously, you know, that's to do with uh, taking people down just being a more labor-intensive motion. The one one two was money in this one, you know. I, people anticipated me talking about this; they were just sending me things because I was I was watching a I was at a Eurovision viewing uh, session uh, while these fights were going on, and and I was asking people what's worth watching. An awful lot of it they didn't think was worth watching, and then I was that's really bad because I'm gonna have to watch. I have to watch them anyway after asking people, so <laughs> it just makes me really down on what I've got to do. Um, but. People were telling me, like, well, you're going to end up talking about the 112. And wouldn't you know, I watched it and I was just like, damn, that 112 is, is fantastic. Um, we, we talk about the double jab a lot. I used to talk about it a lot more because, uh, you know, backing off, less so now. Guys are actually learning to move side to side more. And obviously the boxing's getting better in MMA. But backing off has always been the big answer to striking in MMA. And I've been working on advanced striking Dustin Poirier this week um, and last week. But one of the big things is that the shift that he uses is built for MMA because MMA fighters run forward and backwards and fight from too far out, or certainly did when he started out. Uh, and it's still quite common, you know, the giving ground is the go-to uh, method of defense. But the double jab is a more um, orthodox sort of way to deal with guys who give too much ground. You use the double jab to um, move your feet and cover ground and to force them backwards. And the double jab is not in itself a threat. I'm not saying you go out there like Sonny Liston or you pump out two, you know, piston-like punches that if they don't connect, you've spent a lot of energy doing. But the moment that the, basically the double jab is there as like a, hey, move back or this is going in your eye. And if you feel them there, you follow with the right hand. But the double jab moves the guy backwards and you use the boundary of whatever you're fighting in to um, your advantage you, you make them run onto it and if they're a, you know if they're a normal fighter they will run onto it and you can use that and if they're a very good fighter they will run onto where they are aware of it and they will start trying to make decisions to, to circle out and get away from it and you can use that if you're you know if you're a really good fighter 
but it's using the boundary to create pressure from behind them and you do that by double jabbing them back or you um you know a uh, kickboxing slash muay thai one pick up your lead knee and just glide in behind it you don't need to tape them you don't need to push kick you just pick it up fall down you know just glide forwards on on your rear leg um the opening moments of man gonna gonna please the thai nerds here diesel noy versus um sam art if you watch that one diesel noy picks up his lead leg glides towards him doesn't actually throw anything comes down in range and throws a jab and inside low kick and it's just mm, perfect um and he does that a lot in the fight he just picks up a knee as if to teep but glides in instead and it's it's taking you no energy to pick up your leg and put it down you know teeping takes energy missing a teep takes energy if you do if you throw a teep there's probably a good chance that he's going to catch it and come back at you but if you pick your leg up and his answer is to move back that's free you know if you flick out a jab and the guy's answer is to move back that's free movement that you've just generated and Font used that masterfully in this fight because Cody Garbrandt kept running himself onto the fence. He'd keep like weaving his head and showing fancy head movement. And Rob Font would go, yeah, I'm just going to keep flicking this jab at you and then digging the odd body shot or catching you with the right hand while you're leaning. Actually, the way Font was using his jab in this one circles us back to uh, Advanced Striking 2.0, Tommy, Tommy Loughran. Uh, we were talking about how Loughran used his jab basically as a control tool. He would score it, but also after every jab, he was, uh, you know, acquiring some kind of grip or clinch um, and, you know, turning the jab into the frame or the cross face. Of, so you throw your left jab, um, the opponent slips to the elbow side, you frame on the side of their neck um, or as they you jab, they slip inside, you pull down their head or you frame over their shoulders to stop the right hand. You saw Rob using his jab and then uh, either blocking or controlling Cody afterwards at several points, especially because he was overreacting with big leans. But um, and I think when we're talking about the wrestling stuff and I said that, you know, that's something that wears as the fight goes on, you're less likely to, to go for takedowns regularly. Uh, you also saw Font open up with kicks more through round four and five, because that's always a question, too, when you've got someone who is probably on the worst end of the wrestling um, but they have, you know, that you want to see them strike. Be, not being able to kick confidently is a real, um, it, it's handcuffing you. We talked before about how a lot of um, quality kickers in uh, kickboxing, Muay Thai, so on, gravitate towards punching in MMA just because it's safer, balance-wise. Um, but once you see someone really mastering boxing and, and uh, footwork and controlling the distance and where the exchanges happen in MMA, the body kicks are something that you really want to see more of because they just, they're devastating. They very quickly take it out of people. So it was nice to see Font get a few of those off. Didn't ever really look like he was super comfortable kicking a lot. Um, but, you know, that's that's the thing. I mean, C Cody Garbrandt, for however bamboozled he was by Font's jab, he was in condition and he didn't look like he was super gassed even by the fifth round. And in the fifth round, actually, Garbrandt did some of his better work. It was it was very interesting listening to his corner because they were calling for, um, uh, you know, they were saying, we need you to throw combinations. We need to throw you more than one twos. Um, you know, you need to throw some out there, get some volume going and so on. But you can't really combination punch on the back foot. So they're saying get out in the center of the cage. But every time the jab comes... He's backing up because that's the way that you, that's the way you can deal with it. And it was also it's a human reaction. If something's coming too fast, a lot of it is from the opponent being too close for you to realize, you know, for you to be able to pick up on um, what they're doing. And this links back to exactly what we were saying last week and earlier. If Font can stand on top of him to where the jab is just a shoulder shrug away, that's a real, you know, it doesn't matter how fast Cody Garbrandt can move and how um, blisteringly fast his punches are and how heavy he hits. If he can't react in time, the jab's going to chew him up. And I think that's what we found. Like, if you put Cody Garbrandt on the end of boxing range and you keep him there for five rounds, he doesn't look anywhere near as fast because he's not got the reactions to, to pull that off. Or certainly the comfort at that range. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying, like, um, Dom Cruz or... or uh, someone else could in that division could just come out and do that rob font has one of the better jabs in mma and uh, i realize i say that a lot <laughs> people are always commenting uh jack slack two times a podcast this guy is one of the few guys in mma who uses the jab <laughs> but yes I, I understand that people weren't super stoked by this fight it wasn't um 
the most entertaining fight in the world. It, it was a controlling sort of clinic, but Rob Font has had moments of fantastic violence in the UFC, uh, in, in addition to being a technical virtuoso. Um, and, and Cody Garbrandt is obviously known for being a massive hitter. So I feel a lot of people came into this expecting fireworks and they ended up with a guy just trying to solve a Rubik's Cube as it was gently bounced off his head over and over again. Um, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Now, what else was there on this card that's worth talking about? Oh, Carlos Barza versus Zian Zhao Nan. I was quite surprised by this, actually. Um, I thought Zhao Nan was going to be big and strong enough to deal with the the takedowns. And Carlos Barza has been having a comeback, but it's been quite a... You know, there's been some split decisions and stuff, but she's actually been doing pretty well lately. Yes, it's weird. She's now sort of worked herself into another t- another shot at the title. She won f- against Rose. It was for the vacant title. Um, and now she's going to get her shot to get it back from Rose, which is very interesting. Uh, a cool little story, actually. But um, yes, I mean, this was... I said it afterwards, but thank you to the Mounted Crucifix for ruining my bet on all decisions in women's matches. <laughs> Honestly, though, you know, I've said before... Um, women should focus more on elbows and uh, kicks because they don't have the power. You know, almost all of them don't have the power to to knock people out with their hands. Um, you know, it'll happen from time to time. Guys, will, uh, Girls will walk onto a punch and, and hurt themselves. But, you know, you only need to look at Cyborg versus Leslie Smith this weekend. Same size, same weight, same height, but one of them could hit and one of them can't. And it, it just, the whole fight is dictated by that. If you literally can't hurt the other person when you hit them clean, you've got nothing to keep them off you if they can hurt you. But the uh, the Mounted Crucifix is genius because you don't have to hit hard. It's a, an exploitation of the rules, basically, that if you cannot intelligently defend yourself, the fight has to be stopped. And you can't intelligently defend yourself if both your hands are pinned to the mat and the other person is like gently slapping your face and going, come on, <laughs> do something. Um... So yes, this one, the uh, Valentina Shevchenko one. Apparently there's only been 11 stoppages like this in the UFC. I mean, Matt Hughes did um, BJ Penn in their second fight. Uh, Ivan Salivary made it famous. Obviously, Habib used it all the time, but never stopped anyone there. Um, it, I mean, it's a way to... It's, it's a way to land free blows on someone, but Carla Esparza, if you if you let her hit you from guard a dozen times clean, I don't think she stops anyone, but... The, the rules are that if you are if you aren't intelligently defending yourself, it's getting stopped. Meanwhile, Yan Jianan looked dreadful in this fight. Um, you know what she does is a good kick and then some straight punches, but she was just walking on to these takedown attempts. She was. You've seen Carlos Barza struggle in the past because she doesn't have very good striking, and she is for that even for that weight class a midget. Uh, so she has to like sprint over distance because these girls are controlling the distance against her and making her fight from further out. And Yan Jian Nan just walked up like, "Yeah, uh, I'm going to throw these punches." Oh no, she's on my hips. Then she almost armbarred herself from the bottom of side control, which was great. And I don't, you know, hmm, bot- bottom game in MMA is is a tricky subject anyway because it is a losing battle almost always you are not gonna win a fight from the bottom against anyone good and any any time you are on the bottom you're losing but i did notice that yan jen you know it's one thing to be like oh you gotta bump your hips and get back to guard and so on very hard to do there's a reason that top position rocks and, and bottom position sucks um but the wall walk is a super important part of mma and as much as we say like War walking against Habib is a losing battle because he's so good at counterfighting it. Um, the reason that he got good at that is because people were so good at standing up along the fence. It was a necessary innovation. Um, Yan Chenan spent the entire time out in the middle of the cage and never at any point... Obviously, being pinned underneath someone is not great. You know, it's, it's not a, mo- a, pl- a position where you're very mobile and agile. But you have seen hundreds of times before... People move themselves towards the fence from the bottom once the opponent's past their guard even and um, use either to scoot to the fence and try and stand up or to use their feet on the fence to turn over or make something happen. And side control generally is something that a lot of fighters steer away from actively because they prefer half guard because you've got a bo- the bottom leg trapped. Uh, side control, you know, we were talking about Rob Whitaker versus Kelvin Gastelum the other week. The moment that he passed, Kelvin Gastelum bucked 
turned away from Rob, showed his back, went to the turtle and stood up. But it did just look like Yan Jianan didn't really have a lot aside from I'm going to try and recover guard. And I don't even know the um, use of recovering guard in MMA when it takes so long to do against someone who's actively trying to stop you. But yes, well done to Carla Esparza. Feel good story of the uh, weekend. What else did I watch? Vandera versus Taffel was crap. Dumont versus Spencer was crap. Oh, Ricardo Ramos versus um, Bill Algio, which we were waiting for. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and no fucking Rabona kicks. I thought he'd throw one in just to say I'm still that bitch, but um, he didn't. Uh, he actually fought really smart and uh, sharply. And it, sh- it showed again what he is good at uh, and what Ricardo Ramos is good at is starting an exchange with like a leaping left hook or something and ducking under your return. They did it three times in this fight, I think, um, and did it in his last one too, even when he was focused entirely on the Rabona. Um, but he'll throw a punch, duck under the return, and when I say duck under, I mean duck under like in wrestling. Uh, if you go under someone's arm in wrestling and then you stand up, basically into their armpit firstly you're moving them around you a little bit but also you're just on their back um and duck hunters are important in like jiu-jitsu as well you'll occasionally see them in judo for guys well i mean you would when pickups were allowed Uh, i think pickups are only allowed in combination now i don't know the judo rules they change them every week but duck hunters are a very useful part of wrestling and um ricardo ramos boxes into them it's really nice it's how he constantly ends up on his opponent's backs. Think of, you know, slipping under an opponent's um, jab or left hook or whatever and standing up into their armpit and pushing your head against them so that they turn. And that's how you get someone's back. That's that's the duck under in a boxing context. Um, and it doesn't sound like it should work, but Ricardo Ramos does it all the time. He was also hitting some really nice uh, inside trips from the clinch in this one. Basically, punch and clutch, Ricardo Ramos is very good at. And Bill Algio wasn't bad here either. I really liked his, um, he was throwing a, he was throwing two shifts. He was shifting twice and stepping through on a back kick, Kung Lee style. Kung Lee used to throw, Kung Lee used to do one where he'd throw his right straight or his left straight, whatever leg he had back, uh, and then step through and back kick with what was the front leg. And that's what Algio was doing several times in this one. It was really cool. There was actually a few things in that fight that I thought were very cool and I wanted to talk about, and now I can't remember them. Maybe I'll, I'll write something about it, but... Yes, um, good to have Ricardo Ramos back in the winning column and not fucking around with Rabona kicks. Jack Hermanson versus Edwin Shabazian was tough. It's getting harder to watch Jack Hermanson freak out when guys have power. I've never seen anyone look as un- as uncomfortable on the feet as he does against people who can hit and stop a takedown because like he's just like he stops striking altogether and just starts diving at legs from miles away. Um, and the first two rounds of this were that. And then the third round, Jack Manson just took him down and mauled him. <laughs> like he just, Edmund, Edmund Shabazian just sort of hit a wall and couldn't do anything. There was some very nice, um, he'd pick up the single leg with the head on the outside on the, on the clinch. He'd go for, a, uh, run the pipe. And then as Shabazian hopped backwards and was balancing himself, he'd switch to the double leg. That was really nice. Not much else to say about that fight. Just pretty good. I thought Shabazian looked good for two rounds. Uh, I thought... Uh, Jack Manson did the savvy vet thing and, and pulled it out in the third Ben Rothwell versus Chris Barnett um, super weird to see Chris Barnett in the Venom shorts but is there a more perfect UFC heavyweight than Chris Barnett uh, because he turns he's 5'9 and uh, 263 pounds and he gasses out almost immediately and the funny thing is that you can see from the stuff he's doing that he could be quite a good fighter but he's doing things that you need to be able to do multiple times. <laughs> so, like, he was doing the um, the Valentina Shevchenko I'm scared of, of Amanda Nunes combo, which is leaping a Superman punch into step-up low kick with your lead leg. That is the only thing that Valentina Shevchenko did against Nunes in their second fight. She did it about 100 times. And she did it to get off the fence, too. And Chris Barnett did it three or four times to, to Ben Rothwell, landed the, the kick clean every time. But it's like, what's the point of trying to accumulate low kicks if throwing four of them is going to make you more tired than landing them? It's going to make it him. Yes, a lot of this was just Chris Barnett head down, swinging, slowing down very, very quickly. And Rothwell, to his credit, looked clever. You know, he looked like he knew exactly what to expect here. Um, In the very first round, he took a couple of punches to the head because Barnett's actually really fast um, for a heavyweight. And 
Rothwell jabbed him back to the fence and hit him with an uppercut to the body. And I went, oh, yeah, he knows what he's doing. And so then, like, three or four body shots later, Barnett is already gassed. Um, taken down, controlled for the most of the first round. Uh, and then second round, basically dived in on Rothwell and got uh, guillotined, go-go choked, as Ben Rothwell calls it. But it basically uh, cupped hands straight into the Adam's apple or the go-go, as they apparently call it in Brazil. Heard someone describe it as a, as a diesel squeezel. It is not a diesel squeezel. It is just, uh, I mean, it's not a 10 finger guillotine either. It's just a, a front choke on the Adam's apple. T-Rex guillotine is sometimes what you call it here, here it called too. Um, 10 finger guillotine. Actually, yeah, it could be a 10 finger guillotine, but that tends to be sort of like cupping both hands. This is, He's very clearly holding one fist and pulling it into the Adam's apple. Um, but the diesel squeezel is a... A subtler move. If you want to see the diesel squeeze on action, I was I was actually writing about it the other day because I was doing a, uh, a filthy casuals quickie on Keenan, which I didn't release. But Keenan Cornelius showed the diesel squeezel on his YouTube channel, and a week later went to the Pan Ams and uh, submitted like three guys with it. In fact, the final he won by DQ because he diesel squeezled the guy on his knees, and the guy. Uh, crawled backwards out, out of the mat, <laughs> and even in Bra- even in Brazil against Keenan Cornelius as a Brazilian, they had to be like, no, that's that's not legal. <laughs> Trying to think if there's been any good example of the diesel squeezel in MMA. Uh, I mean, it's, it's possible because it's a no gi choke, but um, no, I can't think of any. Neil Melanson teaches it as a gun choke, but I don't think I've seen any of his lads finish with it. Actually, the way that Rothwell finished his choke, which is, you know, uh, elbows tight and on the Adam's apple, is the way that uh, Marcelo Garcia starts a lot of his guillotines. He goes uh, very tight hands on the Adam's apple, squeezing. And then uh, as the opponent tries to fight the hands, he pops their head under his uh, armpit and goes to the high elbow guillotine. But, yeah, no, too much describing grappling now. I know it pisses people off. Um, what else was good? David Dvorak versus uh, Juan Camilo Ronderas was weird. Um, this guy did take the fight at short notice, so uh, respect to him. Like, they announced that he was stepping in at the weigh-ins. But Ronderas is, you know, 4-1, and one, so they were desperate because Dvorak is... Uh, tw- well, no, he was 19-3, and three, and now he's 20-3. So clearly they were desperate, but they booked it for flyweight still, and then Ronderas missed weight, and they find him 20% of his purse. If it's last minute, and the guy's saying, yeah, I'm near enough weight... Just make it a catchweight fight in the first place. Don't make it a catchweight fight afterwards. Um, just surreal. And I've seen a lot of people like, in the comments on the the uh, original news articles being like, well, it shows, that he it allows him to show Dana that he's ready to step in and blah, blah, blah. Just all, it was kind of like when Bruno Silva held up a sign saying 70K, 75K Dana, um, which is hilarious because they did go straight back to 50K bonuses after doing 75k because Tony Ferguson said so for UFC 262 or whatever it was um but also yeah just what a, a gross look for your company the the UFC Twitter tweeted out this this picture of him holding an A4 piece of paper with um 75k Dana on it and you're like that that's a shit advertisement why are you doing that no one in the NBA is having to do that like please pay me every day this sport is more embarrassing to itself but, um, sorry, Giancarlo uh, Ronderas, Dvorak looked gigantic here, and I forgot they were flyweights, because I was like, damn, that dude looks like six foot. He's five foot five. He's <laughs> just like, they, they are all very small down there. But uh, got on his back very early, and Ronderas basically didn't seem to know what to do. Uh, he, he was not really fighting the hands very well, uh, and Dvorak snuck a hand across his throat, finished him with a one-armed choke, which is legit. You know, you see that in ADCC from time to time. You see it in, in Nogi competition all the time. Um, it's just that he didn't really do anything to occupy. Well, actually, he did. He he used like an uppercut grip on his far hand to free it. Um, but there wasn't an awful lot of hand fighting going on from Dvorak because he didn't need to. Ronderos wasn't really doing anything. Um, yes, yeah, so very strange. But I hope they give Ronderos another fight sometime soon against someone you know more on his level. You know, someone who doesn't have four times as many fights. And then Bruno Silva landed a, a couple of good right straights on Victor Rodriguez to score a knockout. I like Bruno Silva. His last one, I guess, was that JP Buys he, he fought last time. He's a fun guy. He's, he's, he's banging people out at flyweight, which is what they need down there. And then Demira Ismagulov versus Rafael Alves was um, 
Strange, because you can always bet on Demir as, as uh, Ismagulov, but you can also bet on him to not finish. Like he's just he's just a dreadful finisher. He, uh, and it's not like he never looks like he has his opponent in trouble. I've seen him get people in trouble plenty of times. It's kind of like Gray Maynard back in the day would drop people and then not be able to actually score a stoppage. He had like infinite decisions and no stoppages. Um, but Rafael Alves dropped him very early on. You know, he was the black explosive guy in this one, and immediately jumped a guillotine and gave up the rest of the round <laughs> just what, what do we say what unless unless you're charles Oliveira or the doom don't jump a guillotine um and then you know you saw him on the bottom in, in half guard and there, there, was, there was lots of bottom half guard in this fight and what i took away from it i mean at one point he even pulled him into half guard and tried to attack him from there but the thing with uh, half guard generally watch their legs how actually active are they with their legs if the leg is just being used as like a, a, a you know a buffer between you and the opponent that's real like entry level basic half guard stuff um it's kind of like ryan hall and gordon ryan and, and anyone who plays the half guard will will com- will immediately complain about uh people getting the underhook and keeping the knee shield at the same time on the same side because they're two things that accomplish different goals but Good bottom players from their half guard, in MMA especially, are going to be looking for the butterfly hook um, or coming up on the underhook and, and letting the knee shield out or attacking the legs. And Rafael Alves, was, or, and they'll use the high knee shield a lot more in MMA because uh, of the punches coming over the top. You can't really know, low knee shield as effectively. But Rafael Alves was just keeping his knee pinned on this guy's hips, basically across his belly, getting flattened out over and over again. Um, anytime that like it looked like they were going to get past uh half guard like uh Alves was going to try and stand up or Ismagulov was going to pass Ismagulov would pick up his top le- his top leg and hook the bottom one and he's just keeping him on his back with one leg trapped all the time there was however a I mean it shows why you don't part or why a lot of people don't pass anymore but Alves went to his his turtle and he hit a gramby which is a, a roll over the shoulders and I mean it's, it's different in jiu-jitsu and uh, wrestling a gramby in jiu-jitsu it's like how you get back to guard you roll over your shoulder and you open your legs up and land with them between your legs in wrestling you grab across your shoulders and land on your knees which is a little bit scary if your neck if you're um, worried about it but uh, it, then you turn back into them and try and take them down from their knees but rafael alves managed to grab and then end up in a head spin which was the most incredible thing i think i saw this well definitely the most incredible thing i saw this weekend um you know, it reminded you, yeah, this guy's super explosive. That's what he's known for. And then there were, I mean, there were lots of moments like that where he'd throw flying knees or all sorts of shit at Ismagulov. And then he'd just give up position and get stuck in, you know, bottom half, which is, as we said, the least explosive position. So Ismagulov climbs to 23 and 1, undefeated in 18 fights in a row. And still nobody cares. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that was, that was your lot for that card. And then Bellator had a couple of things going on. Uh, I haven't watched the English fights yet. I know Brett Johns got upset, which was interesting. But um, Chris Cyborg versus Leslie Smith was, like we said earlier, just one person had power and one person didn't. The uh, There was a great knockdown, though. It might have been the last one, but um, the highlight I posted on my Twitter. Uh, Leslie Smith throws a, a body kick. Cyborg cut kicks underneath it and kicks the standing leg. Leslie Smith's completely thrown off balance and Cyborg comes in and not, uh, drops her with a one-two. And uh, I mean, that's where my thinking has been a lot lately, uh, you know, uh, rather than boxing into kicks, kicking to off balance and entering with the boxing. Uh, but it was very cool. And then Austin Vanderfield beat Fabian Edwards, which was interesting. Um, oh, and then the one that everyone was talking about, obviously, as well, Sadawad, actually, you know, you could get three to one on Sadawad and Ben Rothwell, which I was going to. And then I thought, no, Sadawad's on a four fight losing streak, even though I like him. But he smoked Nate Andrews. Um, Dropped him like four times in the course of getting this stoppage. But the uh, real interesting one was Valerie Laredo versus Hannah Guy, which the Bellator, they bumped up to the main card because they're so proud of Valerie Laredo. I mean, Valerie Laredo uh, has like 900,000 followers on Instagram, uh, has one of the most successful OnlyFans pages, and Bellator are desperate for her to be as good a fighter as she is um, a looker. But she fought this last Hannah Guy. She was the, you, you could get one pound if you bet six on her. That's how much of a favourite she was here. And she fucked it up. <laughs> it was just so bad. Because Hannah Guy couldn't really... St- well, couldn't strike at all, but could kind of grapple. And Valerie Valer- Valer- Laredo couldn't grapple at all, but could kind of strike. 
So Hannah Guy's running it forward with both hands punching at the same time, and the raid is swinging back and then ending up on the bottom. Um, uh, it made, uh, there was a she went for like a jump double spin and just fell over. It was like Uriah Hall versus um, Robert Whittaker. And they spent half the fight in arm bars because <laughs> Hannah Guy could get him easily but couldn't finish him. Uh, oh, it's just it was dreadful. And Big John's trying to like sell it like a technical chess match. Um, I mean, just Bellator in a nutshell, really. But I reckon that'll do us for today. We're going to be back Wednesday, even though there is no fights now in the UFC until the 5th. We're going to be back on um, Wednesday, Thursday, and we'll be talking about... Probably going to take a lot of questions. So if you've got a question for the podcast or a statement that needs reading to um, the people who listen to this, jackslackpodcast at gmail.com. If you want to read what I'm writing at any time, and hopefully Dustin Poirier Advanced Striking 2.0 is going to be out this week, um, sign up to the Patreon, become a boy, support the podcast. And if you want to read what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I am your boy Jack Slack. Post in hold to advertise my fights. Bless.